Today we're going to talk about the opening of the Arctic waters, the political, economical, and environmental and social uh, consequences. And I think uh, we're very lucky to have these two very talented people who have some um, pretty good knowledge about the situation. First, Professor Michael Byers. He's a professor and Canadian research chair in global politics and international law at the University of British Columbia. And prior to that, he was at Duke University and other places. Um, his work focus is on the Arctic, the use of military force, and Canadian-United States relations. Uh, he has books, his most recent book on international law and the Arctic. Um, he was awarded a $50,000 Donner Prize for the best book on the public policy in Canada. Then is uh, Rear Admiral Jeffrey Garrett, U.S. Coast Guard retired. He's a graduate of the Coast Guard Academy and the Naval Postgraduate School, spent much of his active duty career in the Coast Guard involved in polar operations and icebreaking. His service includes command of the polar icebreakers, polar sea and Healy, and numerous deployments to various ports of the Arctic and Antarctica. And since retiring, he has continued uh, participating in a number of Arctic st uh, studies with the National Academy of Science Committees, um, his ice piloting, whatever that is, and consulting projects concerning polar issues. So next we'll have Professor Byers. Uh, it's wonderful to be here uh, and, and to follow such a distinguished speaker as uh, Admiral Garrett, who, who actually did most of my work for me. Uh, with that, that tour de force um, uh, of the Arctic. Um, it's also really good to be here because I actually live just 25 miles directly west of here on Salt Spring Island, British Columbia, south of the 49th parallel. <laughs> and uh, and therefore uh, reminded daily by the, the presence of our, our benevolent neighbor, the United States. Um, <laughs> I also have two children who were born in uh, the United States, in Durham, North Carolina, when I was a professor at Duke University. And the eldest, who is 13, wants to join the US Coast Guard. <laughs> and I fully support his plans, because it's a remarkable service, and it does your country proud, just as the Canadian Coast Guard does my country proud. The Arctic is a dangerous place. Climate change is, is happening. In fact, it's happening with blinding speed. I have seen entire glaciers disappear in just five years on Baffin Island in northeastern Canada. And I have seen, as, as Admiral Garrett has seen, an ice-free Northwest Passage in the late summer, um, where historically, um, 30 feet or more of thick, hard, multi-year ice would block the way. It's a remarkable transformation. Anyone here who has any question about the reality of climate change, just go north. And remember that this is happening at blinding speed within human lifetimes rather than at geological speed. This is radically different from anything that planet Earth has seen before. That's one message. The Arctic is, as Senator John McCain has said, our canary in the coal mine when it comes to climate change. Speaking of, of, of the dangers, and I want to underline this, um, because the, the dangers of the Arctic, the inhospitality, inhospitality, inhospitality of the island, of the Arctic, the, the remoteness um, impacts upon, upon everything that, that we as countries um, do there. In the last four years, I have lost four friends in aviation accidents in the Arctic, including the three men on the Coast Guard icebreaker uh, last September. And despite, or perhaps because of climate change, there are persistent and new challenges in the Arctic. So for instance, um, between Baffin Island in Canada's northeast and Greenland, we actually see more icebergs than we used to. Because climate change is melting the surface of the Greenland ice cap, which means that more water is finding its way down to the base of the ice cap, 
and lubricating the movement of the glaciers into the sea. And the glaciers are therefore calving more quickly into icebergs, and we see an increase in icebergs. So although the sea ice, which forms on the ocean, is disappearing, there is more glacial ice in the water, and that glacial ice is very hard. It's thousands of years old. And that's the kind of ice that poses a very serious danger to ships um, because it floats low in the water and has a consistency similar to concrete. And so the Admiral, I think, will agree with me in saying that, that operating north of Alaska is fundamentally different from operating in Baffin Bay because of the different kinds of ice that exist. All kinds of dangers. To, to give you another example, I was speaking to a conference of uh, shipping executives from Asian countries a few years ago who were gleefully anticipating the commercial opportunities of a seasonally ice-free Arctic, planning to send thousands of container ships along the north coast of Russia and indeed of, of Alaska and Canada. And, and I looked at them and I said, well, have you heard of, of icing? And, they, they, and these were men who made millions of dollars each year being executives of major corporations. And they looked at me and said, icing? What's that? And I explained that, that icing is what happens if you have open water, but the air temperature is below freezing, and there are gale force winds and waves and spray. And so the water sprays up on the superstructure of the ship and freezes and builds up, and if not dealt with, can cause the vessel to overturn and sink. Hmm. New dangers, new challenges. Another example um, that comes with uh, climate change and the improved accessibility is the, the challenge of, of non-state security threats. I remember how in, in 2005 the then U.S. Ambassador to Canada, Paul Salucci, publicly stated that he had asked the State Department to re-examine the United States legal position concerning the Northwest Passage. Now, just so you know, the U.S. position is that the Northwest Passage is an international strait that is open to foreign shipping pretty much without restraint. Canada's position is that it constitutes Canadian internal waters subject to the full force of, of Canadian law. And Ambassador Salucci in 2005 said, well, in a post 9-11 world, maybe the Canadian position makes more sense for the United States because of the possibility of terrorists using the Northwest Passage to access North America. And wouldn't it be better to have the full force of Canadian law applying, given that Canada and the United States are partners in the defense of, of North America? So climate change, disappearing ice, new kinds of security threats, creating new potential risks. And I could go on, and Admiral Garrett has already mentioned this and talk about the environmental risks of shipping oil, of drilling for oil in the Arctic. And let me just mention in that context that we need to be very careful when we drill for oil or ship oil or indeed run cargo ships through that are carrying large amounts of bunker oil because of the extreme fragility of the Arctic marine environment. The remoteness of the region and the fact that oil does not degrade and dissipate in the same way in frigid Arctic water as it would, for instance, in the Gulf of Mexico, where fortunately there was a lot of bacterial activity that could help to degrade the oil after that terrible blowout a few years ago. New risks, new challenges. Now, the, the good news is that Arctic nations are cooperating. To give you one example, Admiral Garrett showed you a slide where he pointed at the US um, icebreaker Healy doing 
bathymetry with the multi-beam sonar. He should have also pointed out that there was a second red and white ship in the picture. He was pressed for time. <laughs> Which was the Canadian Coast Guard icebreaker, <laughs> the Louis S. Saint Laurent. Because the US Coast Guard and the Canadian Coast Guard are very, you know, they're pretty strong friends. And they realized that, that conducting this kind of research with just one icebreaker is hardly optimal because if you're breaking ice, you're creating noise and vibrations that distort the scientific data that's being collected by your instruments. The best way to do it is to have two icebreakers working in tandem. Icebreaker in front, breaking the ice, the other one tucked in behind, collecting the, the bathymetry, or, or if it's the US icebreaker in front and the Canadian icebreaker behind, doing the seismic work, measuring the, the, the geology of the seabed. And that's what Canada and the United States did in the Beaufort Sea and further northward in the Canadian Canada Basin for, I think, four summers in a row. And so I can say to you that, that much of that expanse of seabed over which you and your children and grandchildren will hold title in the future comes to you courtesy of a Canadian Coast Guard icebreaker because <laughs> you could not done it, have done it without us, just as on the Canadian side, we owe the US Coast Guard our gratitude because we have all kinds of data that we could not have collected on our own. And the same kind of cooperation will eventually occur with regards to the Northwest Passage, despite our different legal positions. I'm hopeful that we can come to a, a legal resolution of some kind. Um, I, I would just mention here that, that we actually share control over a very important waterway that, that passes through and is uh, sovereign, either in some stretches, uh, sovereign uh, Canadian uh, water or, or in other stretches, uh, sovereign American water, and that is the St. Lawrence Seaway, which we built together as two nations. Or to give you another example, um, the Strait of Juan de Fuca and Harrow Strait and Boundary Pass, just off of Bellingham here, is an international strait. Like the U.S. position on the Northwest Passage, but with intense cooperation from the two coastal states, the US on one side and Canada on the other. And as the Admiral pointed out, the US is coming to the realization that it is in fact what is called, this is a legal term, a straight state. <laughs> because of Bering Strait, because of the Strait of Juan de Fuca, and also I should mention um, because of uh, Unimac Pass, which is a, a narrow channel through the Aleutian Islands, um, which accommodates already uh, roughly 5,000 large cargo ships each year. And that is an international strait too, and the United States has to figure out with Canada and other countries how we cooperate to tighten regulations, improve standards in these waterways, some of which pass through exceedingly uh, fragile areas and are subject to, or will be subject to, much more traffic. So. Just to give you one final example, just offshore, I don't know how many of you know about Kinder Morgan Pipeline's plans for Juan de Fuca Strait, which involve more than one large tanker a day full of bitumen from northern Alberta, shipped to Burnaby in Vancouver, and then out from there through the waters off the coastline of this beautiful state. So we need to figure out um, our two governments, uh, how to make sure that, uh, that that only happens if it can be truly safe. Um, one last thing to, to mention in the night, I do want to, uh, to turn to, to questions. And that concerns, uh, in respect of, of cooperation, concerns Russia. Uh, you'll see from this, this map, that I think is on most um, tables, that um, Russia has very significant Arctic interests, uh, in large part because uh, Russia, um, in terms of its land territory, extends around roughly half of the Arctic Ocean. 
Russia is still, after the dissolution of the Soviet Union, still by far the largest nation on earth. And a very large portion of Russia is in the Arctic, and Russia already obtains roughly 20% of its gross domestic product from its Arctic regions. Russia is a serious Arctic country. It has, for instance, 16 deep water ports along its northern coastline. The United States has none. Canada's uh, most uh, northern port is actually in the province of Manitoba, uh, at the very south end of Hudson Bay, um, roughly 1,000 miles from the Northwest Passage, so we essentially have none as well. Um, Russia is way ahead of us in terms of developing its own Arctic. Russia is also a party to the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, and it's no surprise why they chose to be a member, because with that enormous coastline come extensive rights, which are recognized in the convention. And just in case anyone is wondering, um, the United States has not ratified the convention, but um, Successive administrations, starting with the Reagan administration, have recognized the key provisions as binding customary international law, and it's on that basis that the Coast Guard and the Navy operate. Um, so Russia has an interest in having a recognized exclusive economic zone of 200 nautical miles off of its shoreline, which includes off of its islands, which give it vast, vast EEZs. It, it has a, an interest in the possibility of asserting rights over extended continental shelves and has been collecting an awful lot of scientific data to that end and indeed cooperating uh, with other countries. There was a promising moment a few years ago when Canada and Denmark pooled their financial resources to charter a Russian icebreaker to map the seabed near the North Pole. Um, and uh, to give you a sense as to how far this cooperation extends, I have actually um, traveled through the Northwest Passage, through what Canada regards as internal waters, on a ship owned by the Russian Academy of Science, with the full permission of the Canadian government, I should say. So when you see what's happening in Ukraine, be very concerned about the relationship between NATO and Russia in Ukraine and around Ukraine. But don't necessarily assume that those tensions will extend to the Arctic. Russia has been cooperating very well in the Arctic. Just a few years ago, it, together with the United States, led the negotiation of an Arctic-wide search and rescue treaty. More recently, it partnered in the negotiation of a treaty on oil spill preparedness and response. And as I've said, Russia is cooperating in terms of sharing data with respect to extended continental shelves and has every interest in following the rules in the Convention on the Law of the Sea. Russia is very keen to develop international shipping through its northern waters and charges tolls, sorry, they're not tolls, they're fees for ice-breaking escorts. I sometimes think that Canada and the United States might do the same thing on a cost recovery basis. And Russia is concerned about non-state threats along its northern coastline. There are smugglers in Russia, just like there are smugglers in the San Juan Islands and southern Gulf Islands. Russia has concerns about terrorism. And Russia is concerned about the safety challenges raised by having 70 or more large cargo ships transiting the entire northern sea route each summer. I see no evidence that Russia is preparing for state-to-state -state conflict in the Arctic. 
Now, I have met Vladimir Putin, and I dislike Vladimir Putin. <laughs> but I can see a rational actor when I look at Vladimir Putin, operating within his own framework, getting away with what he can. And there are two things that Vladimir Putin knows about the Arctic. One thing he knows is that militarizing the Arctic would be extraordinarily expensive, would be measured in hundreds of billions of dollars. The Soviet Union militarized the Arctic, and look where that took it. Again, incredible remoteness, punishing temperatures, challenges like sea ice and glacial ice, and don't forget the several months of total darkness and winter. Not a place where you invest in a military that you don't think you'll need in that region. And then there's another consideration. Russia is desperate to develop its Arctic offshore oil and gas. Again, already 20% of its GDP comes from its Arctic region. Much of that comes from oil and gas onshore. Those reserves are being exhausted. It needs to move offshore. And guess what? It doesn't have the capital or the technology to do that. And so Russia has been courting Western companies like Statoil, the Norwegian state-owned oil company that is the leader in Arctic offshore oil and gas, and BP, and Exxon, and Shell, and other major Western players, because they need that technology, they need that capital. And yes, they're trying to get technology and capital from China and elsewhere also, but this is the future economy and therefore the political future of their president, Vladimir Putin, and he is not a stupid man. So just last week, for instance, in a speech, he directed comments at Canada and said, stay away from Ukraine. Canada's a long way away from Ukraine, but guess what? Russia recognizes that we have similar Arctic interests. That's a message that the Canadian Prime Minister is digesting. It's one that the, the Obama administration already understands. There are enough problems in the world, there are enough challenges in the NATO-Russian relationship that to extend those problems into the Arctic would be to the benefit of no one. We live in dangerous and uncertain times, but the good news is that a quarter century after the end of the Cold War, the potential for war in the Arctic is not one of our, or should not be one of our major concerns. Non-state actors, yes. Climate change, absolutely. Search and rescue, the other challenges that arise from an increasingly busy Arctic. These are all important. We need to step up, Canada, the United States, other countries. But if anyone tells you that, that we're going to see another ice station zebra. You can tell them that they should listen to Admiral Garrett and the other wise people who work or until recently worked for the US government. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think, uh, once again, a lot of information. And thank you for covering the Russian end. I think that's a lot of us have questions there. Now it's the time for questions. And I have two people who are going to carry mics. OK. OK. Over here in this corner and here. Chuck and Jane. Oh, I thought that was yours. And um, as usual, members with badges have first choice on questions. So just let one of the spotters raise your hand. There have to be questions. <laughs> OK, one back here. What is the possibility? I don't understand much about the oil thing. But let's say that 
there was a lot of oil that was, in fact, harvested out of the Arctic region. What is its importance on being able to take that oil and bring it to Washington State and dock it at the coal terminal so that we could unload to oil refineries here to process it? Is that a concern? Michael? Uh, it, it should be. Um, and, and despite the, the excitement about Arctic oil and gas, um, if one actually goes back and looks at the U.S. Geological Survey report that caused all the excitement um, some five or six years ago, uh, the U.S. Uh, GS is careful to point out that, that their total estimates for undiscovered uh, reserves in the entire Arctic amount to roughly three years of global supply. Um, Arctic oil and gas is not going to uh, get us past peak oil. Um, if anything, it's only going to buy us a couple of years. Um, and look, my own view is that we should get on with the transition to alternative sources of energy. Um, and and not, not risk this beautiful coastline to, to eke out a couple of extra years of oil. I say one question, two yes, questions on the same. Does the technology exist to clean up an oil spill if one should occur in the Arctic? No. <laughs> Is this on? Yeah. No, it's not. And certainly, you know, as uh, Dr. Byers mentioned, Repeat the question. Does, does the technology exist to clean up an oil spill in the Arctic? Uh, as, as, as Dr. Byers pointed out, you know, the, the Macondo Deepwater Horizon spill in the Gulf of Mexico was actually a, a great place for it to happen if it was going to happen because you had the warm weather, uh, reasonable sea conditions, lots of infrastructure along the coast, lots of, uh, you know, pre-staged cleanup materials. Uh, the ability to deploy all kinds of uh, response forces and the bacterial action that actually degraded a lot of the oil naturally. All of those things don't exist in the Arctic. So you, you, you've, got, you've got seasonal ice cover, you've got all, which nobody knows how to clean it up once it gets under the ice. Uh, you've got cold water, uh, cold air temperatures. You don't have any infrastructure up there to speak of. Uh, although there is some in Prudhoe Bay, but not, but not very much. So no, it would be very, it was a big National Academy study recently released on that, and it's, it's full of questions. Uh, one, just one, one more, one thing I'll add is the, I think Norway has done some experimentation with in situ burning to, to basically burn it off. Uh, the U.S. to date has not allowed that to even be tested. So the, so the one thing that might actually work as a last ditch effort to get some of the oil off the water, uh, we, we, won't, we, don't, we haven't even tested for it yet uh, extensively, so it, it's kind of a, it's a situation that just is uh, mind-boggling if, if a large oil spill were to happen. Hi, my question's about, uh, it seems like commerce is getting um, fairly far ahead of our ability to respond to catastrophe. Um, the question was great for the technology to clean it up. Where, can you tell us where the nearest containment equipment is for a, an oil spill in Canada or the U.S. And my second question on that would be, um, there's cruises to the Ar Arctic from uh, Nunavut. You can cruise like a cruise ship. Where's the nearest uh, Coast Guard response from either country if there were a, a, a catastrophe on a cruise ship? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I won't speak to the, uh, the U.S. Uh, state of preparedness, although I can say it's better than, than the situation in Canada. Um, there are a handful of small shipping containers, the real small ones, um, and only a handful positioned across the Canadian Arctic with booms in them to deal with an oil spill, which would essentially be for a small leak uh, from the engine room of a ship. <laughs> um, not even from the fuel tanks, because the, the, the booms wouldn't be large enough. Um, the, the entire population of, of Nunavut, uh, the, the, the territory of Nunavut, is 30,000 people, and that's one-fifth of Canada's geography, right? So that there are no people, there are no ports, um, and, and Canada is only just waking up to, to the challenges of all this, this increased activity. Um, 
uh, and, and yes, you, you're right about uh, the cruise ships. Uh, we've been really lucky so far. If the Clipper Adventurer, which went on ground on a rock uh, a few years ago, had done so during an Arctic storm, it would have been torn apart and 150 people would have died. No question. Um, and, and I'll just raise one more thing. Uh, on any given day, more people fly over the Canadian Arctic than live on the ground. So if you're flying to, to Europe from uh, Seattle, you're flying over the Canadian Arctic. And, and if you uh, have to crash land um, in winter, um, just pray it's a really bad crash. Yeah. Because we will not get to you. Right. And, and you will freeze. I'm sorry to be so harsh, but this is the reality that, that we deal with. The Arctic is a large, remote, dangerous place and yet there are all kinds of things that are pulling human activity north. And, and governments have to step up and, and take on some responsibility. Just from the Alaska perspective, the, you know, the, the largest Coast Guard base in the country is in Kodiak on the southern coast of Alaska, which sounds OK, so that's pretty good, right? But that's 850 nautical miles from Point Barrel. Mm -hmm. And so even though there are fixed wing C-130 aircraft, long range helicopters, and a number of uh, cutters based in Kodiak, the ability to get them up to the Arctic is, would, take, would take quite a while. However, for the last five summers, the U.S. Coast Guard has deployed uh, a couple of helicopters and some, some people up to the North Slope, both to provide some kind of you know, marginal response capability, but also to test out gear, operational procedures, and that sort of thing in the Arctic. So we're, we're slowly gaining. For many years, we never went up there other than an occasional icebreaker cruise, mainly focused on science. But uh, you know, now I think we're, we're gaining, the, the service is gaining some uh, operational experience in the Arctic, and certainly, if, if nothing else, becoming aware of what the problems are. But the same thing with oil spill response equipment. Most of it is in probably in Prince William Sound in Valdez uh, and down in Anchorage on Cook Inlet. There is some in Prudhoe Bay, but it would be, but, but for a very large spill, it would be a massive undertaking. We would have to pull equipment from nationwide, as we did in the Gulf of Mexico several years ago. Chuck, yes. What do you know about the oil recovery barge that's sitting, Shell's oil recovery barge that's sitting down at the, at the dock? Only that this, this Arctic containment system of which the barge is part of it is, I, I believe, still figures in their plans for when, if and when they go back to the Arctic uh, to try to complete one of those exploratory wells. Mm -hmm. Well, it had some problems. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You're right. If I could just mention here, um, one of the, the things that, that we need to make, make absolutely certain happens in Arctic offshore drilling into the future in all Arctic countries is a requirement for same season relief well capability. And because the Arctic season is very short, that capability has to be right there on standby, ready to go. Otherwise, that oil is going to be spilling into the ocean from a blown out well for at least another 10 months before the ice clears and equipment can get back. So, so in, in various countries, including Canada, there's been an effort to reduce that requirement of same season relief well capability and, and the, the general public in both countries must stand firm on this. Agreed, yeah. Yes. What do you know about the, the uh, Canadian uh, efforts on that pipeline that's coming out and their work with the um, native peoples there? <laughs> Um, well, there are two uh, pipelines proposed for the west coast of British Columbia. The first is a new pipeline that would go from Alberta to, to Kitimat uh, on the, the north coast of British Columbia, just south of the Alaska Panhandle. Um, and uh, regulatory approval has been granted except for the last stage, which is the Prime Minister deciding probably in the next month whether to, to green light it. The good news there is that um, uh, the coastal First Nations, the, the Canadian Indian uh, tribes along the coast are adamantly opposed and are going to tie that project up in the courts for at least a decade. Um, if, you want to, <laughs> if you want to make an investment in stopping oil uh, tanker traffic on the west coast, give some money to a First Nations legal defense fund. <laughs> um, the, 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 the second pipeline is actually a pipeline expansion proposal, and that's for the Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain Pipeline that comes to Burnaby, uh, which is 
alongside Vancouver Harbor and then out down Georgia Strait and out through Juan de Fuca Strait. Proposal is to um, essentially uh, increase the capacity of that pipeline four or five fold uh, and start using uh, tankers to, to ship uh, uh, diluted bitumen uh, to Asia. Um, I, I'm actually an intervener in, in the regulatory process, um, so I'm not exactly uh, objective on this. Um, but I can tell you that, that most people in British Columbia see absolutely no gain for British Columbia and a whole lot of risk being imposed upon us. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the strongest opponents of this uh, pipeline are the uh, city councils of uh, Vancouver, Burnaby and Victoria. Um, and I'm actually confident that, that, that with your help, um, <laughs> Uh, the help of Washington State, uh, perhaps uh, some of your uh, federal politicians, that, that we could stop the second project also. Okay, thank you. That's all the time we have for questions from both panelists. Uh, Dr. Byers does have to leave to catch a ferry. He's hoping to. Um, I was going to give them each an extra minute or two, but if he doesn't need that, I'm going to present you, both of you, with uh, a gift we always give to our speakers. It's Watkin Places too, and we hope you both will come back and enjoy what we have here. Thank you. Thank you very much.